Okay. So much stimulation. You careful, don't trip. 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 I see that this um, screen covers up the clock, so we'll just keep you here all night. Yeah. All night. <laughs> Well, welcome, and uh, I guess tonight's a little bit nicer out than last night to have a lecture. I was really grateful that we were able to uh, um, be able to be here tonight, um, because trying to reschedule these things can be quite tricky, getting everybody in the same place. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lori Brinklow. I'm Matthew Conin. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Master of Arts and Island Studies program here, and the chair of the executive committee of the Institute of Island Studies. And uh, this is a lecture uh, series that we've been, the Institute has been running since, oh, I first joined the Institute in 1990, and they were going strong then. At that time, we would have um, a whole month of lectures every Monday night, I think, or Tuesday night, I forget, and then they would go off into the rest of the island. So we would be coordinating 12 and 14 different lectures on a topic. And so over the years, it's kind of shrunk down until we uh, maybe can do eight in a season um, from September to December, January to April. So this is, then the pandemic came, and so, you know, we did pivot online and went to uh, do a couple that way, but now we're back in person, and we're really grateful that we can actually do it here. So um, happy to have you all here. So I thought I would just begin with a, a short land acknowledgement. Um, to respectfully acknowledge the history, spirituality, culture, and rights of all First Nations, Métis, and Métis and Inuit peoples from coast to coast to coast, who have called this land home since time immemorial, and who continue to experience the ongoing effects of colonialism and systemic racism. This acknowledgement is nothing without action to back it up, and I encourage everyone to consider how we can each in our own way, actively honor and uphold our obligations in a spirit of true reconciliation. After all, we are all treaty people. So, I'll say a few words about the Institute. We are a research, education, and public policy institute. Our offices are just down the hall on the left. We have about four offices there um, that we call home. Uh, we have a small publishing company called Island Studies Press. And uh, we have a Master of Arts and Island Studies program, and it's wonderful to see current students and a couple of our graduates here. So thank you all for coming. Um, you can learn what we do by checking out our website, which is islandstudies.com, or on our social media accounts. And we have a monthly newsletter. So if you're not already subscribed, and uh, this is how you get subscribed if you're not already, you can give me your name and uh, email address, and I promise not to sell the, uh, the list to anybody. Um, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> kind of tough. Support ourselves. No, that's not it. So, um, I'd like to now begin by introducing you to tonight's speaker. Most of you know him already, and if you don't, you will very soon, Dr. Nick Mercer. Um, Nick is a recently appointed professor within UPEI's Master of Arts in Island Studies program and Environmental Studies program. So we're cross-listed, cross-appointment, which we're really, really super pleased to have. And uh, Carolyn Peach Brown here from Environmental Studies, we are um, really both so glad to have him here. Um, he came, came to us from Newfoundland, increasing the Maze program's full-time complement to 1.5. Um, and our population by three, because as joining him were Rebecca and Jack, who just went out of the room. So prior to joining the UPI community, Dr. Mercer held a Shirk postdoctoral research fellowship within Dalhousie University School for Resource and Environmental Studies. In this role, he studied questions of energy justice in isolated northern communities, examining how or if communities have participated in energy-related decision-making, or how or if communities have benefited from development. That's what we're going to be hearing some more about tonight. Dr. Mercer has a long research relationship with remote and island communities, having conducted almost a decade of partnership research with the island of Ponds in Labrador on issues ranging from participatory energy planning to water security to gender dimensions of resource access. Dr. Mercer serves as one of eight appointees to the government of Newfoundland and Labrador's Net Zero Advisory Committee, come on in, and is a vocal advocate for community-led clean energy and practice. Come on in. 
Welcome. So I would like to welcome Dr. Mercer to the podium and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm really glad you're here. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Um, a pleasure to be with you all this evening. That was a really lovely introduction. Thank you so much, Laurie. I had a moment where I realized at a conference in, in Newfoundland about a year ago that every one of those bios you ever will hear, the person who's being introduced probably wrote it themselves. So I, I look at it in a completely different way now. And I think of all these like you know world rulers who are writing their own little uh, bio, and I, uh, I think it's absolutely precious. So uh, maybe on a, a more personal level, then uh, my name is uh, Nick. I came here from Newfoundland. I was actually born on a military base in Nova Scotia. My father was in the Navy, so I was born in. Uh, uh, Bill Cove, but I think of myself as being raised and from uh, where my parents were from. So my, my father was from Trinity Bay in, in Newfoundland. Uh, my mother was from Glace Bay on Cape Breton Island. So uh, those two islands in, in particular have always meant a lot to me. Um, and I'm very delighted to be here this evening to, to talk about Labrador's uh, remote island of ponds. Uh, this place truly means the world to me. I started working with this tiny little Inuit community of 85 uh, about 10 years ago. Um, almost by accident, uh, and here I am this, this evening, 10 years later, uh, talking about the third or fourth big uh, research project we've worked on together, so I'm delighted to uh, share some of those findings with you. Normally I'm a walker when I present, but I know we're recording as well, try to stay as uh, a stationary as possible. So I just want to point out all the lovely photos you're going to see in this presentation. They were taken by an unknown photographer named Tara Keefe. Um, she's a youth from the community. I work in Black Tiggle. She takes really brilliant photo photos. Um, tens of thousands of them. You can find them on her Instagram at Tara underscore Keefe 1996. And she always gives me, me permission to use her work, but I love to, to share and point people in her uh, direction. Um, I mean, I think this goes without saying, but this country that we all call home, uh, Canada, is quite an interesting spot. Uh, typically, we are held up as a global leader uh, with respects to renewable energy development. Um, much of this is attributed to the fact that we currently get about 60% of our power from large-scale hydroelectricity. Another 15% comes from low-emitting nuclear energy, and 7% on top of that comes from non-hydro renewables. So mostly wind, uh, but a growing amount of solar and biomass as well. Uh, so you add all those low carbon sources together and over four-fifths of electricity generation in Canada uh, comes from low carbon sources. The remaining chunk, about 20%, comes from fossil fuels, of course. So predominantly coal out west and in Nova Scotia and a little bit of heavy fuel oil and natural gas mixed into that as well. So on, you know, on the global stage, the point being that uh, Canada is typically celebrated as a leader. Of course, there's always a but. <laughs> Um, where the electricity generation mix differs quite dramatically in this country is at the remote or the off-grid scale. So I'll give you the, the textbook definition of an off-grid community. Uh, so the government of Canada defines an off-grid community with two criteria. Uh, number one, they're not connected to the provincial or territorial electricity grid. So you see all these thick blue lines down in Canada south? That's the grid that brings us power from big power stations, so these communities aren't connected to that. Uh, and number two, they have to be a permanent settlement, not a seasonal settlement or a mining community. Um, a five years or longer with at least ten dwellings. So that's the technical criteria. Uh, but according to those two criteria, there's 258 of these communities uh, located throughout the country in almost every province and territory save for the Maritime. So no off-grid community, formal off-grid communities in New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, or Nova Scotia. Um, there's three very important characteristics about these communities that I want to point out to the room. So number one, uh, the vast majority are dependent on uh, micro diesel generating stations for their power. So of 258 communities, 190 of them rely on these really small school bus sized diesel plants to, to provide their power. Um, and collectively, those 190 communities are burning about 215 million liters of diesel fuel every single year. That doesn't include what's used for space heating, fuel oil, and it doesn't include what's used for uh, transportation. And if you include both of those, it's closer to a billion liters than it is uh, 215 million liters. So lots of diesel fuel uh, is consumed in these uh, tiny communities. 
Uh, second important attribute, a large majority of these communities, about 170 out of 258, are Indigenous communities. So in the Canadian context, that's First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. Um, as such, it's, it's really important that off-grid energy research, off-grid energy policy, off-grid energy advocacy be centered on the rights that Indigenous people possess. Um, and the third, and kind of what, what ties me to the Institute of Island Studies, uh, is many of these communities are located on remote islands. Uh, islandness is pervasive in these communities, so uh, we really can't understand the issue of off-grid diesel dependence or remote community energy sustainability without understanding the nature of islands. So uh, kind of the, the challenges that face islands with respect to sustainable development or the opportunities that face islands with respect to sustainable development. So I'll just point out a few, of course, up north, Baffin Island, uh, just south of that is Belcher Island with that red dot right there. Um, Anacosti Island, of course, located uh, just south of Labrador. Ile de la Magdalene, am I saying that right? The Magdalene Islands in English. Uh, of course, all the communities located on the island of Newfoundland and several islands off of islands as well on Newfoundland. Uh, this little tiny dot in the Labrador Sea, that's the island of Ponce. They're the community I've worked most intimately with. Uh, out west, we've got Vancouver Island, we've got the Haida Gwaii archipelago of islands. Uh, in the western Arctic, we have Banks Island, Victoria Island, that red dot just south of Victoria Island is King Williams Island. To the north of that, that black dot, that's Cornwallis Island, Ellesmere Island. So I think the, the point is made that uh, really islandness is a, a pervasive feature of these communities and it's a, it's a very helpful analytical lens for the remote, isolated communities on the coast that aren't islands, but share so many qualities with, with islands as well. So, uh, those are the three criteria I want to leave you with. They depend on diesel fuel, uh, largely identify as indigenous communities, and islandness, of course, is belonging to islands is, is pervasive to these communities. So, I should grab the water. Is this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very similar story, I'll call, I guess, in, in my ancestral province, at least on my father's side, of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, or uh, Labrador and Newfoundland, as I like to call the province. <laughs> um, the province is, uh, again, typically held up as a global leader with respect to renewable energy development. Um, in 2020, we produced 96% of our electricity from large-scale hydropower, 96%. Um, just show of hands, who have heard of the Muskrat Falls project? And, yeah, virtually everyone. So when or if uh, Muskrat Falls finally comes online, that percentage is actually expected to rise to 98%. So virtually every kilowatt hour of electricity that's produced in Newfoundland and Labrador uh, is renewable. Of course, there's always a but. Um, where the electricity generation mix differs dramatically is that last 2%. <laughs> That last 2% is my entire world, so uh, is that the remote or the off-grid scale? So again, those three attributes, these 19 communities located along the coast of Labrador and along the coast of Newfoundland are almost ex essentially exclusively dependent on diesel fuel, um, combined consuming something like 20 million liters of diesel per year, excluding space heating and transportation, uh, once again. Again, a large majority of these communities, 14 out of 19, are indigenous uh, communities. So, represented by one of Nunatsiavut the government in, in northern Labrador, which is a nook to toot for our beautiful land. Um, this is where I spent a couple of years working after I finished my PhD, first at Goose Bay, then in Nain. Um, Nakushish uh, is an Innu community represented by the Innu Nation. And then in southern Labrador, from Cartwright down to Mary's Harbor, Lodge Bay, even further south into the Labrador Straits, uh, all these communities are represented by the Nunatuavik Community Council. Um, and it's the Nunatuavik Community Council who have long been my, my research partners for the last 10 years. And uh, Black Tickle as well on the island of Ponce, this community I'm going to be talking about today. But again, islandness is pervasive to these communities. So, island of Ponce on Black Tickle. Williams Harbor, island community. I mean, all these communities are island communities, but St. Brendan's, Little Bay Islands, Ramiak are islands off of islands as well. So the point being, islandness is uh, truly per pervasive to this issue. So 
why do we care about this question of diesel generation in, in remote communities? And this is actually the photo of the, the diesel plant in uh, Black Tickle. Um, I mean, a basic Google search, a lit review, uh, is pretty compelling. These, these diesel generators pose some sand economic, environmental, social challenges for off-grid communities. Uh, from an economic perspective, diesel generation is super expensive. So I, I think Maritime Electric charges something like 17 cents a kilowatt hour here on, on Prince Edward Island. The Canadian average is about 12 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. The average unsubsidized cost of diesel in an off-grid community is a staggering dollar thirty a kilowatt hour. So uh, over 10 times more expensive than the Canadian average. You have to, these are remote islands in the north. You have to fly fuel in, you have to barge fuel in, you have to truck fuel in over ice roads. Enormously expensive to generate electricity in these communities. Um, of course, because the cost of electricity is so high, uh, various governments will step in and provide substantive subsidies to keep the rates affordable for consumers. Um, I like to point to Nunavut. Um, there's 40,000 people who live in Nunavut, and they're all spread across 26 of these remote diesel-dependent communities. There's no two communities in Nunavut that are connected by road. They're all remote diesel-dependent off-grid communities. Um, and the territorial government in Nunavut spends one-fifth of its annual budget on the energy needs of the territory. Um, that translates to over $60 million in direct energy subsidies. So these are enormously important dollars that, that could be going towards other priorities like housing, health care, food security, education. Pick the buzzword that you want, Zach. That's where the, the money get, could be allocated. Um, from an environmental perspective, fossil fuel, of course, contributes to global climate change. But um, the risk of fuel spills and leaks is the big concern these communities have in the north. Um, this is a very serious issue, especially in many indigenous communities who, of course, highly value, respect, and depend on the health of the, the land and the environment. Uh, the government of Canada published a report recently that suggested that there's over 2,000 contaminated sites at or near indigenous communities in Canada. And the vast majority of those sites, about 70%, were contaminated by Diesel fuel, yeah, that's the best, that never, when I used to do these lectures uh, via Zoom during the pandemic, that, that bit would never hit, but in person everyone's like, yeah, diesel fuel, <laughs> um, Societal issues, I mean, I go on forever, noise, noise pollution, these things can be loud, noisy, uh, disruptive, especially in quiet, idyllic, isolated, uh, northern environments. So, on the flip side of things, renewable energy technologies, wind turbines, solar panels, small modular nuclear reactors, um, these things are, are increasingly promoted to improve the sustainability of these isolated communities and villages. However, here's where I want to be very careful, um, as my research and the research of other scholars has, has indicated that in the absence of legitimate processes of local ownership of these projects, local control over the projects, local engagement, all of which are embedded in the worldviews of the, the community. Um, these projects can create nor enormous tensions of their own. And this is from a protest in Labrador um, of Muskrat Falls, Don't Poison Labrador again, as an example of that. Recoupal energy is not always perfect. Uh, but I'll give you a, a couple examples specific to off-grid diesel demand. So, number one, and I think this is crucial, um, is misalignment with community needs. So, back in um, 2017, the, the Inuit government I was working for, Nunatsiadu government, uh, published an energy security plan. And what they found was that the greatest energy-related challenge in their territory was heat insecurity, uh, or what they defined at the time as access to clean, affordable, and reliable heat. Uh, they found that in their territory, in some communities, uh, upwards of 60% of Inuit were living in cold or inadequately heated homes. Now, the, the numbers varied by community, but 60% was the greatest in Nain and not far behind that in, in Hopedale. They also found that the vast majority of Inuit in Nunatsiavit were using wood as their primary source of heat, about 90% of households. So if an outside company comes in, Maritime Electric or Walmart Canada or Brookfield Energy, and, and builds a big wind turbine or solar facility, there's almost nothing to improve the most pressing energy-related need in the community. 
because 90% of the homes are using wood. They don't have baseboard heaters. They don't have panels to support electric heat. They're not allowed to use electric heat. So the renewable energy often doesn't solve the most pressing challenges that are evident in the community. Um, number two is self-sufficiency. And I find this one fascinating because there's a, a ton of literature out there that would suggest that renewable energy builds self-sufficiency for these remote communities. And, and scholars will suggest renewable projects do that in three ways. I'll touch on them really quickly. Um, number one, by materially supplying your own source of energy via wind turbine or solar panel, you're less dependent on imports from others, of course. Um, number two, by owning one of these projects, you can kind of facilitate processes of self-decision making or local decision making. Uh, number three, by selling renewable electro electrons to a utility, you can generate some cash, which then you can invest in whatever you want. Uh, there's some emerging scholarship that shows, however, that the inverse is also true. Um, and renewable energies can erode the self-sufficiency of communities in three primary ways. So the first being, far too often, it's not communities themselves that own these projects. It's corporations, it's outside governments, it's outside utilities. Um, and if this is the case, this can lead to further intrusion of Western models of resource governance into these remote communities. So a question I always ask rhetorically when I'm on the island of ponds is, you know, is Black Tickle any better off if Walmart Canada owned a wind farm in this community and exported all the profits to a headquarters in the South? And people will say no. <laughs> um, number two, uh, these projects can unfairly expose Indigenous peoples to the risks that are associated with novel technologies. So think small modular nuclear reactors, for instance. Um, and number three, these projects can create enormous administrative burdens for these tiny, small, remote communities uh, who are already operating at or near or beyond the capacity uh, that they have. Uh, so I've kind of rallied against <laughs> renewable energy here a little bit. But does that mean that we should not pursue uh, sustainable energy initiatives in these isolated, predominantly indigenous communities. And no, this, this is not what I'm arguing. Um, however, what I will suggest is that to have successful sustainable energy initiatives, they need to be grounded in legitimate processes of local ownership, local control, local engagement, the worldviews of locals. So in short, we need to move towards this concept of energy sovereignty. Um, so this is a really great a definition from a paper I love by Ray and Bradley. I've played with it a little bit. Um, but I define energy sovereignty simply as the inherent right of these communities, especially indigenous communities, um, to choose energy systems which can operate entirely in the absence of external control, support, or imports. So the work that I've done on the island of Ponds uh, for the last 10 years has been all about helping the community uh, move towards this concept. Energy sovereignty. So, I get into some of the specific findings first. Of the last of the, a sip of water. I know that's a bit of a roller coaster. I beat up on diesel generators and then I beat up on renewable energy technologies. And, you know, what does this guy want? <laughs> I want energy sovereignty. I want local agency. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been extremely lucky over the last 10 years to work in, in deep partnership with the remote Highland of Ponds in, in Labrador. This is a really remarkable community. Um, the population used to be a lot bigger um, uh, before the collapse of the cod fishery in, in Newfoundland, but there's about 85 permanent residents on the island now, and there are probably hundreds who are there just uh, seasonally in the, the ice-free season. I was showing this picture to Lori earlier, and I gave her a tour around <laughs> town. But uh, I'll point out some of the key infrastructure. This uh, building here, that's St. Peter's All Grade School. There's, I think there's 13 students from K-12 currently in the school. Um, one teacher who also serves as the principal, and it's also her first job. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big job that she has. Uh, this red home here, this is Joseph Keefe's home. Um, Joseph Keefe's kind of like one of the patriarchs of the, the community, but he's also the chairperson of the local service district. Um, I'm not sure if the EEI has local service districts, but um, it's the lowest rung in the Newfoundland Municipalities Act. So uh, it's completely volunteer. They have no taxation powers. They have very little formal authority, but they have an enormous job to deliver services to this community. Um, this is the Black Tickle Community Hall. I couldn't count the number of games of community bingo I've played in this place. It's a really <laughs> remarkable spot. 
clinic is up there. I think there's one nurse who works there and specialists will come in every whenever they can get them. Uh, down at the far end of town, we see the wharf here. Um, again, obviously not a road connected community, uh, but there's a weekly ferry service during the ice free season. And that's not long in Labrador. Um, typically the boats can start running in July and then November, December, uh, it's frozen up again. Uh, so transportation is a big challenge in the community. And in recent years they've been cutting back ferry service. So instead of, you know, once a week now, I think it's maybe four or five times for the, the shipping season. Uh, those big blue tanks, those are the diesel storage tanks. They, you know, they can store a million liters of diesel fuel. The community might consume half of that on a yearly basis. Um, and then you see those power lines um, on the far end of the island. They actually run to a water treatment plant. There's no running water or sewer in the community, so they have to take snowmobile or ATV to go get it. And there's actually another little seasonal community, another harbor that you can't see called uh, Domino. Uh, there's only 12 houses and Domino is completely uh, seasonal at this point. But uh, in either case, this is uh, my little piece of paradise. Um, also, the folks in Black Tickle on average are like five foot tall. And the first time I ever got there and tied up on the Northern Ranger on the wharf and got off the boat, people were like, oh, you're not from here, are you? They said, no. Um, so again, if anyone's having a hard time situating exactly where this is at, um, you see here the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, along Labrador's uh, southern seaboard, about halfway down, uh, maybe two or three miles offshore, you see the island of Ponds. Um, and settlement on the island is exclusively concentrated in that northeastern corner there. So you see the road there which wraps around this harbor, and then Domino is up in that other harbor there. So yeah, this is my, uh, anyways, five minute tour of Black Tickle, the yeah. island of Ponds. Um, so Black Tickle was actually one of, of nine communities that I've with over the, the last decade, um, again, all represented by the, the Nunatuba Community Council. Um, when I was doing my PhD research in the territory, we actually started off in three initial communities, Black Tickle, Norman Bay, and a fly-in, fly-out community in, in St. Louis. Some of them must have liked what we were doing because we were invited back um, and expanded the research model to six new communities, Cartwright, Chella, Town, Pinson, Airport, Hope, Simpson, Mary's Harbor Lodge, I say that ten times fast. <laughs> Um, so across those nine communities, I was really lucky to enter the households of uh, 211 uh, different uh, NCC members, which was really remarkable. So uh, the interviews that we did focused on, on four things, energy related needs. So what are the greatest energy related needs in your community? If a project is ever going to go ahead, what should it actually solve? Um, number two was the future of energy. Um, so. Are you open to making changes to your community's energy system? And if so, what would you like to see and why? Uh, number three was household energy use. So how are you using energy in your home and how can we do that more efficiently? And number four was community motivation. So um, which values should underpin the, the decisions that we make? So I'm gonna go over some key findings now. Uh, in some places, I'll draw just on the Black Tickle data set where we interviewed 33 out of the 80, 85 residents, pretty good sample size. Uh, when I want to make some larger generalizations, I'll, I'll go back to the 211. So if you hear me jumping around a little bit, uh, that's why. Um, so again, the first thing that, that we wanted to do in this community is we wanted to understand the greatest energy related uh, how we did this is we, we did a lit review, uh, we generated 13 potential variables which had been claimed or asserted or in the media as challenges for the community. And we put it to community members themselves, a simple Likert scale on a scale of 1 to 5. The 1 meant we're not concerned about that issue, it's not a problem here. Uh, where the 5 meant we're extremely concerned about that issue, please do something about it. Uh, and as you can see, a couple things emerged at the, the top of our list, both the supplies of fuel in the community and the affordability of home heat now. This is not to mean that things further down our list, like climate change or, or deforestation or noise pollution, aren't concerns. There's many people in the community who are severely concerned about those issues. Uh, however, if we're going to do development which truly reflects the needs of the people and the will of the people and is in service of these people, it needs to be these things at the top of the list that are prioritized with the, these other uh, variables seen as more uh, secondary or, or tangential benefits. This is actually needs-oriented development 
in the community. So, um, again, we didn't just do a, a quantitative a survey, we also did deep qualitative interviews with residents. And um, what we discovered through this, this process is that heat insecurity, again, access to clean, affordable, and reliable heat, is almost a borderline crisis uh, in this community. So, 25% uh, of the population self-reported living in a cold or an inadequately heated home. The true number is likely much higher than that compared to southern standards in Canada. Um, we know uh, uh, that living in a cold or inadequately heated home leads to an adverse array of physical and mental health effects. Cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, exacerbation of minor illnesses like the cold, the flu, arthritis degradation of mental wellness, insomnia. Uh, we had one interview respondent say to us, how am I supposed to be happy when it's so cold? How am I supposed to send my kids to school uh, when it's so cold? So uh, we argued in this research that, that heat insecurity is a borderline crisis, in this, if not an overt crisis in this community. Um, and the challenge is in Black Tickle or the Island of Ponds that any potential fuel source has enormous restrictions in the community. So uh, firewood, for instance, this is what Black Tickle looks like. All right, this is a subarctic tundra island. It's wonderful uh, habitat for caribou, not wonderful habitat for cutting down spruce trees. Um, so community members can't harvest timber locally. Uh, so what they do in the winter time when the ice freezes is they take skidoos west into the wooded sheltered bays uh, on mainland Labrador. They cut timber and they haul it back to the island. It's a round trip of about 80 or 90 kilometers. It's a very important cultural tradition uh, in the community, but there's lots of hidden costs associated with that. So time, labor, fuel, uh, wear and tear, one household member constantly out of the house. It's, it's an enormous chore uh, in these communities. And more recently, many members will say over the last 10, 20, 30 years, that the sea ice that surrounds Black Tickle is becoming less and less reliable. So, you know, Inuit in this region of Labrador will describe sea ice as they're super hot. You know, that's how they get access to resources, and it forms later now, and the ice is of less quality now. So it's much more difficult to get into the base, to get firewood. Um, because there is such a, a lack of wood in the community, um, many households have become reliant through the years on furnace oil or diesel to heat their home. Um, and this, you know, wasn't such a big deal until 2015. Uh, when the sole local fuel supplier in the community, Woodswards Energy, closed up shop completely, uh, citing a lack of profitability. Um, so what happened at that point is community members would wait for freeze out, and they would take their skidoos to the next closest Inuit settlement of Cartwright, uh, located 90 kilometers away. So community members were doing 200 kilometer round trip on snowmobile just to purchase a drum of furnace oil and haul it back to their community. Uh, we interviewed one household who spent $1,200 one winter in gasoline just to go to Cartwright to buy diesel and drag it back uh, to the community. Um, so the, the natural question is, well, why don't people use electric space heating? That seems, that seems straightforward. It's purposely restricted by utility policy <laughs> in these communities. So uh, the way it works in the north is the utilities lose an enormous amount of money for every kilowatt hour of electricity that they sell. Um, so they have policies in place to try to discourage the use of electricity. Uh, it's a volume-based subsidy in Labrador. So you get a thousand kilowatt hours of power for very cheap, about three cents a kilowatt hour. After that, <laughs> uh, electricity rates increase to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so in a harsh Labrador winter on the coast, you use several thousand kilowatt hours, three, four, five, six thousand kilowatt hours a month in the dead of winter. Uh, resulting in artificially high electricity bills of seven, eight, nine, a thousand dollars, and um, in a remote, low-income community, that's almost insurmountable. Uh, even if they could use electric space heating, nobody wants to because there's a risk of prolonged power outages associated with it. Um, it's not the community members themselves who can repair the power lines. So if something goes down, a helicopter has to come in from Goose Bay or from the island of Newfoundland to make repairs. And the weather in this place is miserable in the winter. So it can be three, four, five days without power. So nobody wants to lose that agency by being dependent on the, the local utility. Um, so enormous challenges um, face uh, space heating in these communities in almost every respect. Am I doing that time?
Um, so I'll go, I'll go through the rest of the findings relatively quickly because I want to talk about some of the answers. There's some of the great things you've been doing in the community. Another very interesting finding we had in Black Tickle is that people actually aren't opposed to diesel generation. So again, we asked them to give us an answer scale of 1 to 5, 1 being strongly opposed, 5 being strongly support. The vast majority were neutral, um, kind of like a measured acceptance of diesel or reluctant acceptance. And then we had e perfectly identical segments of the population who were opposed and support. But when we asked them, how, you know, how can you possibly support this? Um, they changed my life entirely. And <laughs> they gave me four key reasons why diesel's actually supported in these remote communities. Number one, it creates really valuable employment opportunities. These are high paying, year round, full time positions in communities where there's essentially no wage labor available. Um, number two is reliability and relative reliability in harsh northern climates. So again, electricity is a matter of survival in the north. You know, a black tickle every winter gets wind speeds of 100, 120, 140 kilometers per hour. And for the most part, the diesel system does a relatively decent job of withstanding this. Number three is familiarity and comfort. You know, these generation stations were imposed on communities, but they've now been there for 30, 40, 50 years. There is an attitude in the community that don't fix what ain't broke, <laughs> it works a lot. This one was shocking to me, this idea of community resilience. So, the idea being, because the diesel plant operators, you know, the two, three, four in each community, have such high paying jobs, flexible jobs, freedom in their positions, they're the ones out on the land getting wood for seniors and elders who can't. They fish, they hunt, they fill the community freezer. Uh, and without these really good diesel plant operation jobs, you would be losing all that enormous set of benefits that the operators uh, provide for the community. So, yeah, doing this qualitative research in, in Black Tickle really challenged some of the biases that, that I was bringing uh, to the issue. Uh, we did want to know if community members were interested in change. So again, we listed a bunch of potential renewable energy technologies, Likert Scale 1-5, and a couple of technologies clearly emerge at the top of wind and solar power. Everything else we tested, there were way too many questions for a project to go ahead. So, tidal power, what will this mean for the commercial fisheries in our community? Wave power, how the hell will we get out of our harbor if there's a wave, is what people wanted to know. Small scale nuclear generation, people said, that's like Homer Simpson, right? We don't, we don't want that here. Uh, but again, a very important finding we had in this research is that there's substantially higher support for energy efficiency technologies in the north than there is for renewable energies. Um, again, this is just a selection, but essentially every energy efficiency technology we tested had massive support in the communities. And when we asked them why this was so, again, they gave us four key reasons, which I think are really important. Um, the first was household savings. So with an energy efficiency technology, be it an LED light bulb, or a heat pump, or insulation, or a freaking clothesline, it's the household member themselves who benefits at the end of the day. Whereas with a renewable energy project, a wind turbine, solar panels, there's no promise that residents are ever going to see any tangible benefit from that. There's wind turbines everywhere on PEI. Can anyone spell out a financial benefit that they've received from that development? Energy efficiency technologies confront that. Um, a second was this idea of incremental transition. So I've argued that Inuit in this community actually value these diesel generators. So you know, instead of coming in and bulldozing the diesel plant, these are smaller, incremental, collective, easy steps everyone can take to, to have the same impact. Um, number three is this idea of relationships. So there's this company that's been operating in Labrador forever called Summerhill. Uh, what they do is they hire locals, they train locals, those locals go around do mini audits and give away energy efficiency products for free. So community members love this, it's free stuff, it's local jobs, it's local training. What's not to love? about this model of development. If anything, they'd like to see more of it. Uh, and fourth was this idea of conservation or alignment with Inuit culture in the community. So we had knowledge keepers argue to us that you know the Inuit way is to use every aspect of every organism that you harvest. If it's caribou, if it's a seal, if it's a bay apple, nothing goes to waste. And the argument being why would we treat energy uh, any differently? So massive support for energy efficiency in this community. Uh, we did a similar process for alternative heat sources. Again, wide acceptance. The one exception actually being heat pumps, which I'll explain on the next slide while there's uh, uh, relative opposition for that. But again, 
uh, high efficiency wood so lots of interest in the community. So, um, we wanted to not only understand quantitatively uh, why people support these techniques, but qualitatively why. Uh, and we did a thematic analysis of the 211 interview transcripts, and we really generated five key reasons why Inuit and Nunatuvit support or oppose sustainable energy, and collectively called it the CARES framework for understanding uh, community support. Um, each being uh, an acronym for a different layer of the model. So C, community familiarity and understanding. Not surprisingly, people support what they understand, right? Diesel generation. Oh, we love it. We've had that in the backyard forever. Small modular nuclear reactor. What the heck is that? We don't want that here. Association with previous projects. We found this was really profound. And this could be positive and negative. So people didn't even want micro hydro or pico hydro in their community because they would say, that's like Muskrat Falls, right? We don't want, which is nothing similar, but it's, that's the association people have. It can be positive as well, though. So these communities continue to live uh, a land and sustenance based lifestyle. Not uncommon for a household to maintain three, four, or five cabins at camps to accommodate each seasonal harvest. And those seasonal camps are more often than not powered by solar panels. And people have had a great experience at the cabins, so they'll say, why can't we do that? And Black Tickle, those positive experiences on the land really encourage optimism for what can be accomplished in the community. Um, ours, relationship, culture, and sustenance, easy. It's not a sustainable energy source to these communities if it threatens their traditional food sources. So examples are plenty, you know, wind turbines which can strike migratory birds, solar farms which can displace berry picking grounds, hydroelectric facilities which can block uh, migratory fish species. If it blocks your food, there's no way they'll ever consider that a sustainable source of energy. E, endogeneity, that's a fancy academic word for localness. So the more local a uh, source of energy, the higher the potential support. If you have a lot of wind in your community, support wind. If you have a lot of sun, you'll support sun. If you don't have any uranium on the island of ponds, you'd probably be a little resistant to importing uranium from Saskatchewan. And security, this is, was very purposely placed at the core of our framework. So these are the benefits of renewable energy projects that developers often cite. Economics, health benefits, reliability benefits. What we found in our research, none of that matters if you can't maintain the outer layers. So we can't skip over these important cultural um, implications of energy systems in the name of energy security. We have to maintain the entire conceptual model. Um, so in my uh, field of research, uh, I kind of situate myself as a, a community-based energy sustainability scholar. It's not enough just to do research. We, we have to move beyond doing research solely for the sake of doing research. Uh, and we have uh, an obligation to actually do something about it, to actually make a uh, meaningful difference in the lives of the participants that we, we study. So I'll touch on a couple projects quickly. Uh, this picture is not from the Island of Ponds, but it's from one of the other communities I work in, uh, Aries Harbor Lodge Bay. And it's actually one of the, it is the largest off-grid uh, solar installation in uh, Labrador. That's a big accomplishment uh, for the community. So, the first thing, big success that we had as a result of this research is we opened a gas station. So. Um, you may find it curious that a self-described um, radical environmentalist is celebrating uh, helping to open a gas station in, in remote Labrador, but in this case I am quite proud. Uh, you cannot survive in the remote and diesel dependent north currently without reliable access to diesel and gasoline. Uh, the people who live on the island of Ponce, they need this. They need it to hunt, they need it to fish, they need it to gather, they need it to cut wood, they need it to visit family members and adjacent communities. Um, without fuel, there is no life in the, the remote north. Um, so we were able to um, kind of highlight this need, and then the governing body, the Nanatuva Community Council, Block Tickle Local Service District, the federal government, the Alcoa, stepped up, put in a bunch of money uh, to establish a, a social enterprise fuel station. So this is great, there's no profit motive anymore. Um, any revenue that is generated is direct, invested directly back in uh, to the operation. Um, and one really cool thing uh, that they did was it was based on a model of collaboration instead of competition. So they got together with all the other businesses in the community and they asked, what gaps can we fill? What isn't in Black Tickle? You know, we don't want to supply Twix bars and bags of chips. Uh, what is it that you can't get in that we can provide as a, as a service? So this opened in uh, 
2021, and it has made an enormous difference, I think, in the, the lives of community members. Um, but again, the community does not want to be stuck on uh, diesel forever. They want to take steps to, to transition away. So uh, during my, my postdoctoral research fellowship at, at Dow, before I came to uh, UPEI, I'm still working on this project, uh, we launched a high efficiency wood stove pilot project in the community. And these, I'm not sure if anyone has experience with these stoves, but they're quite remarkable uh, for two reasons. They emit a lot less pollutants than conventional wood stoves. So a conventional stove will emit about 25 grams of particulate matter per hour, where an EPA high efficiency wood stove will emit two grams of particulate matter an hour or less. Uh, so that's, you know, this model anyway is a 96% improvement in the amount of particulate matter in the air in the, these remote communities. They also cut into wood consumption enormously. So industry figures very widely, but uh, I'll take them at surface level and say anywhere from a 33 to 50% reduction. So if you're a household in Black Tickle relying exclusively on wood, burning 10 cords per winter in the harsh Labrador winter, one of these stoves will cut you to anywhere between five and six and a half cords. That's a ton less labor, a ton less time spilt on the land, a ton less gasoline going back and forth to bays, a ton less time being on untrustworthy uh, sea ice. So we're hopeful that these stoves are gonna make a major difference in the, the lives of community members. These retrofits are complete. We opened it up to anyone who wanted one. I have 14 out of 30 homes in the community available for the project. What's really a bit interesting about this work, it was a truly participatory model of resource governance. So community members themselves consented to the project over other alternatives. They picked the home selection and prioritization criteria. They even told us how they want to evaluate the project, which we think Trisha is going to work on uh, as part of his uh, uh, master's thesis. And, uh, I mean, a third piece of the project I'm, I'm quite excited about is local hiring and skills transfer. So we had to go to tender to get an outside consultant because insurance companies will only provide insurance if a wet certified inspector does these things. And we didn't want to leave the homes without insurance. Um, so we hired an outside contractor, but they partnered with these two local you know, carpenters in the community. Uh, and they started the formal training process with them. So hopefully by, by the time we do a project in another community, It'll be these guys and their, their colleagues and workers and employees and families who are, are helping to lead the way. Um, we do have another project currently in the design stage, is a, a home energy uh, repair program, but I, I feel like I've talked enough uh, to this point. So I'll just briefly, um, I mean, <laughs> an enormous amount of resources have been pumped into this work uh, over the years. So the Nunatuavik Community Council, um, they paid for the second phase of this research by themselves. They saw such value in the model that they said, you need to come back, spread this through our whole territory, we'll find the money, which was uh, really exciting. Conservation Corps Newfoundland Labrador, they provided us money to hire youth at every stage of the project. That's a shared future. It's a CIHR funded research project. It's excellent to have indigenous and non-indigenous scholars from coast to coast to coast who are studying the intersection of renewable energy and reconciliation. They took in money for the project. And that's NRCAN's Indigenous Off Diesel Initiative, and then Shirk, of course, supported me as a, a scholar. Um, so that's some of the work we've done on the remote island of, of ponds in Labrador to, to try to shift towards a community-led model of uh, energy resilience. I'd be delighted to open things up for discussion. Yeah, I can elaborate quickly. Um, so I started working on the Island of Ponds actually back in 2013-2014. Uh, by accident, I just applied, I needed some money and I applied to an RA job ad as a senior undergrad. Uh, and I started building figures for this professor who's doing this work on the Island of Ponds. So I got to know the community a little bit and they said, well, put together a research proposal to do some work with us once this is done. I said, okay. So I wrote this proposal about energy planning, and they read it and threw it in the garbage. And I was like, what? Like, why would you ask me to do that? And they're like, listen, look, it's not because we don't like you or don't see value in what you're proposing, but this community doesn't have running water. Um, and we cannot, in good faith, um, allocate resources or attention to wind turbines uh, well, our people you know, are thirsty and sick. Um, so are you interested in doing something about water security? I didn't know a thing. But 
I was like, yeah, okay, I'll figure it out. So uh, we did a, a half decade research on kind of the half decade of research on the nature of water insecurity in the community. Uh, we implemented a domestic rainwater harvesting pilot project so people could harness slop water, right, what they call a general use water, uh, right on their doorstep. And then kind of after that half a decade, they were like, okay, do the energy stuff now. Um, so I, it was an important lesson for me as a scholar. Um, I learned working on these remote islands, sometimes you have to put your own stuff aside and stack chairs or install water barrels or just do what needs to be done um, before you can move on to your own interests and priorities. Perhaps you could put some of those. Do you see the social enterprise um, model as I would like to see it. Um, it's not happening, however. Uh, a really fascinating analysis came out of the University of Victoria, Victoria late, recently, um, where they studied every remote renewable energy project in the Canadian North, um, and they found that Indigenous people own less than one quarter of the renewable energy projects in the North. So that means that 75% of renewable energy projects on Indigenous lands are owned by outsiders. Um, so I have raised this with the federal government at various points and they've pushed back, well, you aren't counting super small projects like net metering, that's like six solar panels on a home and that's not moving the needle for anyone. Um, so we are getting better, I think, at the micro, micro, micro scale, uh, but for the large scale projects that actually move the needle and generate revenue and help to decarbonize economies and societies, uh, we're not there yet. Um, I mean, part of the reason, uh, I love Black Tickle, uh, and I love this model of resource development, but I mean, we don't just do it purely for the 85 people there, it's a model for the world. Um, to show that this can be done, and it can be executed fairly, and it can make a big difference in, in people's lives. We think, although Tristan's research might discover uh, otherwise, maybe I got this all, all wrong, which we're open to. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I kind of raised that and said I would explain it and then I moved away from it. Uh, yeah, everyone, especially on PEI, seems to think heat pumps are the answer to, to decarbonizing home heat. Um, rarely makes sense in the context of the diesel dependent north. And I'll, I'll rely on my CARES framework for a couple explanations. A to C, community familiarity and understanding. Imagine being on the island of ponds and, you know, Nick Mercer, mechanic, shows up out of nowhere and says, look at this thing, right? <laughs> People are kind of resistant for that reason. Uh, but the big thing is actually related to the endogeneity or the localness of the resource. Um, so when we talk about local resource development, we're not only talking about the physical resource like the sun or the wind or the waves. We're also talking about the human resources, so the people who install and maintain these things. Uh, and we're talking about the financial resources as well, so where the investment comes from uh, and where the profits end up. In much of the criticism of heat pumps, that we saw in our research follows the criticism of electric heat. Um, so if there's big power outages in the winter, uh, it's not Joe or Jane Mechanic down the street who's coming in to fix it. You're reliant on helicopters, twin otters, and boats from Canada South. And every time you have to bring in a, a technician from the South to the North, it's several thousand dollars before they even get there to start the work. Um, if anyone in here has a heat pump, it needs to be maintained by a certified technician to respect many of the warranties that cover uh, these things. So it's just almost an impossibility on these remote islands to get the staff in to do the work uh, that's required. So I would argue, at least in the context of the island of ponds, heat pumps could be considered an exogenous or a non-local resource which erodes community support. Whereas the wood, it's right there in the bay. It's how people get on the land, it's how they spend time with their families, it's how they get out and shoot a few partridges while they're uh, cutting logs. It's, it's a part of the lifestyle, it's an endogenous resource. Does that help to answer yeah. your question? Wonderful. Uh, just on the point of heat pumps, um, the, the issue of maintenance is even an issue on PEI. Yep. Um, I've been hearing, especially like the earlier heat pumps that were put in, a lot of people cannot get them maintained. In right. So they're basically, you know, people who've made the switch to heat pumps now don't have a heat source. Yep. Yeah, I've, um, well, I did my postdoc at, at Dalhousie, but I met lots of people in Halifax.
Halifax who are quite proud of their heat pumps. In Halifax, they're coal-powered heat pumps, which I find uh, absolutely <laughs> hilarious. But it was a similar issue. A, to get them installed, the wait list at this point was years and years and years. Uh, and then to get them maintained to the warranty standard could be months and months and months. So uh, people were, were losing their agency. They were losing that endogenous aspect of the, the energy system, which really rode support over time. What is the mean temperature in the winter? Very cold. <laughs> so the climate um, is influenced harshly by the currents of the uh, Labrador Sea. Actually, all along the coast of Labrador, because it's not um, quite as far north as other areas of Nunavut and Northwest Territories and uh, the Yukon, but the climate is very similar because of the currents associated uh, with the Labrador Sea. So I, I would be guessing for mean temperature by month, but minus 20 and beyond, uh, certainly and just a paradise of ice for hundreds of kilometers in, in every direction. This is a harsh, <coughs> subarctic coastal land. That, that's, a, um, from what I do understand uh, about heat pumps, that's a challenge for yes. heat pumps when the temperature drops right. to, or it's, is consistently so cold. Right. That, yeah. um, my wife and I have a winterized cottage here in PEI, and it has one mini-split heat pump in it. It doesn't even do a good job here on cold days. Yeah. But again, going back to that CARES framework, the security dimension, reliability of heating is a big aspect of social acceptance. Um, heat pumps work really good in the shoulder season in Labrador. So in the fall, when it starts to cool off, it's fine. Um, in the spring, when it starts to warm up a little bit, it's fine. In the dead of the winter, in minus 20, 30, 40, with howling winds and ice, it's not going to cut it. Yeah. Um, I just was wondering, because the Canadian government settled so many indigenous communities in places that was not where they traditionally would have lived in the north. Was the Ottawa Ponds, was that part of where um, indigenous people of that part of uh, Labrador would have typically lived, but possibly, or, or, were, or were they like told you have to go live there by the Canadian government at some point in time? Yeah, so um, my dear colleague and mentor from the Nunatuvik Community Council, Dr. Amy Hudson, has wrote a whole dissertation on this exact topic, and she cringes whenever I talk about the history of Inuit, uh, but I'll try to do it as concisely as possible. Yes, many communities in Nunatuvik um, were encouraged at the hands of the provincial government to relocate uh, permanently for the stated purposes of uh, service delivery, so schooling. They were told to go to one place and stay there year-round to go to school. Um, so traditionally, most communities in Nunatuavit were uh, practiced seasonal transhumans, is the technical academic term, which basically means they followed the harvest. Uh, so in the winter, they would go into the interior of Labrador and shoot caribou, um, and in the summer, they would go out to the ponds um, to net salmon and pick uh, berries. Uh, but kind of that urged settlement is oftentimes at the root of these energy crises that we see. Because the Inuit who, you know, occupied Sandwich Bay in this area of Labrador knew you couldn't stay out on the coast in the winter because it was cold, miserable, and horrible. They would go into better suited, more sheltered places in the bay. So the federal government actually, one of the big funding arms they have um, for diesel projects is called the Indigenous Off Diesel Initiative. And it actually really bothers me, that, that terminology, because A, it's directing communities what to do. It's not energy sovereignty. But it also fails to recognize the colonial roots of energy security in the North, where these communities were told where to be and where to settle. So I think that you know the energy restitution initiative would be a far more uh, appropriate term, but we're not there yet. a question, but I find it kind of interesting to come here tonight because I was, I'm familiar with those communities. Mm -hmm. I was up there, I think, I think it was the winter of 96, and uh, worked a little bit for Holland, for, for uh, <laughs> not Holland, but Barbara College, mm -hmm. and I stayed in, in Dominic, and oh, wow. Domino, and and work in black pickle. So I don't think it sounds 
like things haven't changed too much in <laughs> uh, all those years. But, yeah. So uh, it was a, uh, I say that uh, Charlie Moore is, yep. and Charlie and De Debbie, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, made a beautiful new home and a kitchen and bathroom and everything, but no, but no running water. Right. <laughs> you know, we had well, to go to the community well to flush, flush the toilet. And, yep. and then he made all those long, long trips. Right. And I couldn't believe the, how much time he spent going for wood. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very nice to meet you and hear about your uh, experience. It resonates with a lot of what I've heard from the elders and the knowledge keepers in the community will often say, you know, this community, the island of Ponce, was the epicenter of the cod fishing universe. I mean, people all over the world got rich um, based off of the resources offshore of this island. And if a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of that revenue would have been put back in the community, the roads would have been paved with gold and uh, everyone would have had, you know, a toilet and a shower and the basic, just a heat pump and the, the basic... Uh, necessities of life. So, yeah, that, that certainly resonates. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm interested, um, maybe because I'm a um, thesis student struggling to uh, get my thesis started and finished, <laughs> uh, but on the um, how you got into community based research, right? And how you kind of <coughs> Yeah, you can just describe that a little bit more. Yeah, a uh, complete accident. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, so when I started studying community-based research with these Enoch scholars from Labrador, they, they taught me a bunch of principles that really resonated with me. Um, you know, lots of times natural scientists are trained to be objective, and, uh, but community-based researchers, we were trained to be respectful, reciprocal, relational, and respect the rights of communities. And I was like, you telling me you can have a career by just trying to be a good person? <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's brilliant. And all of that really resonated with me in my life. And uh, um, certainly the thing that my parents and community had, had tried to pass on to me. Um, so from a very early stage, uh, I was excited about those principles. But I guess more logistically speaking, in this field of research, community-based research, you just can't pick a community off a map. Black Tickle Island of Ponds, we were talking about Pond in it earlier, and saying, I'm going to do participatory energy planning here. It has to be driven by the relationships that you have. There has to be a level of trust. It has to be in service of the community. You have to be willing to put your own uh, biases and prejudices aside and just serve others. Um, and that's what I, I, f I have failed many times in trying to do that over the last 10 years, uh, but still here, still standing. Um, another thing my mentors in Labrador have taught me as well um, is that kind of the conventional measures of academic success don't really matter. Like when you're working in these communities in the north, no one cares about how many publications you have or what your H10 index is or what conference papers you <coughs> presented. And I remember asking my mentors once, um, well, if you don't care about any of that, like, how do I know if I'm doing a good job? And they're like, well, if we invite you back, you're doing, <laughs> you're doing a good job. So I, I had to get the, I always get their permission to even do presentations like this because I'm putting their knowledge and their communities and their issues out into the world. Um, so that's another piece, to, to be in service of others and to respect their, their needs and priorities. But if it's a field that you're, you're genuinely interested in, um, I'd be more than healthy to, to be privately and kind of maybe share a little insight. Yes. Is it prevalent at all? Or? It is um, very prevalent. Um, of the two options we tested in the community, solar was very high. People often criticize communities in the north. They're like, oh, it's dark for six months of the year. And community members will say, yeah, well, it's bright for six months of the year as well. Um, so a lot of these very far north communities actually have a surprisingly hot solar uh, potential. Um, yeah, solar is a very passive technology. It's not really intrusive on the landscape. It certainly doesn't affect migratory birds or 
um, a fish species, there is a lot of excitement about solar. Um, <laughs> Hi, Jack. <laughs> Jack's excited about solar as well. Um, the problem that we have in the north is the cost of wind and solar are astronomical. Um, so a rule of thumb in the south of Canada is that an installed kilowatt of solar is anywhere from three to five thousand dollars. So if you, I see homes everywhere on PEI with six kilowatts of solar on, that might be an eighteen thousand dollar installation. An equivalent installation in the north, in Black Tickle, it can be anywhere from eight to fifteen thousand um, dollars, which is you know several orders of magnitude. More expensive. So we went to tender recently in Black Tickle. We wanted to do a demonstration solar project. Uh, we were going to install eight kilowatts, which using PEI numbers would be like a twenty-five thousand dollar project. The one we got was for one hundred fifty thousand dollars. The companies, you know, they'll absolutely gouge you. Um, they have to send their crews in from the south. All these issues island studies with islands struggle with with respect to remote islands with respect to sustainable development. And to me, that money is so much better placed in people's homes. For $150,000, for $80,000, we gave every single home in the community a high efficiency uh, wood stove. So it's, it's, it's really difficult to do renewable energy projects in the remote diesel powered world. Yeah. Where exactly is that? itself um, has done, I mean this always happens in Newfoundland, if they spent the money they did on feasibility studies on infrastructure, the water issue probably would have been solved a, a long time ago. Um, they have looked into doing some type of formal water distribution in the community. It's the same project, we have, the same problem we have with electricity transmission lines though, where to convert it and make it a usable AC current for such a small number of people. The cost is just on um, millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, for the 85 people who are located on the community. Now the community would tell you, you know, water is a human right, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be a question, but normally the feasibility studies are, are mothballed because of the costs um, associated with them. Um, again, where we had some luck in the community was doing uh, the domestic rain water harvesting. Um, I mean, the systems we had set up were pretty rudimentary. It was a rain barrel <coughs> and a rain saucer, and it would fill up quickly. But you can use the eaves on your home and great big buckets and collect an enormous uh, amount of water. But if it was up to me, I'd say, you know, these communities didn't choose to settle here. Pay, give them the money that they need to have. But this is why I'm a professor and not uh, an economic development officer or the CEO of a corporation. Does that help to answer your question? Yeah. Is there any source of groundwater? No. Um, it's hit or miss. I mean, it's a hard, rocky, tundra environment. Um, again, it comes back to questions of endogeneity. So some um, families have paid for companies to come, $10,000 or whatever, to get a drill truck and a crew to come in, and they drill down a couple hundred feet and they hit dust. Uh, so it's an enormously risky and, a, and an enormous expense uh, associated. Um, not safe to drink, still water, predominantly. Yeah, there's 365 ponds on the island of ponds, one for every day of the year. I'm going to count them one day and see if that's just... <laughs> 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 Just thinking about names, I just wonder if Tickle has a special meaning in Newfoundland or in Labrador, because Black Tickle is an unusual name. Yeah, uh, they just love to tickle, it would sound. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm being cheeky. Um, a tickle in Newfoundland refers to a really narrow body of water um, that separates two pieces of land. So there's the harbor in Black Tickle, but on the far side of the community, there's an actual tickle of water that runs uh, right in. I have many cups of tea and yarns uh, down on the wharf there. So does that help to answer your question? Well, thank you. This is a wonderful discussion and great introduction to um, Island of Ponds and Black Tickle and the work that you're doing. It's really important and I keep telling Mike, we need a wood stove! Watch <laughs> out for that heat pump! Endogenous <laughs> <laughs> resource development. Exactly. We got the wood! <laughs> Thanks to Fiona. No, I really, really appreciate it.
appreciate um, your introduction to our island studies community and the environmental studies community and Charlottetown. So we're so glad that you came. So thank you. I have a gift of a book in the potato bag. And um, if you haven't already, we can trade. Because we have a lot of books. I don't have this one. Wonderful. Okay, The Taste of Islands by Dr. So I'll just mention, um, we uh, thanks Mike for videotaping our lecture, as always. Um, we will put it on our islandstudies.com website, and um, it will be usually announced.